Dear guests, uh, I am David Wertheim, and as director of the Manasseh Ben Israel Institute, it is with great pleasure that I welcome you in such great numbers to our second lecture in our series about synagogue and state. Uh, I would like to welcome you not only on behalf of the Manasseh Ben Israel Institute, but also on behalf of its supporters, the uh, Jewish Historical Museum, uh, Jood's Historisch Museum in Amsterdam, and the Universiteit van Amsterdam, the University of Amsterdam. To, be uh, to begin, I would like to make two short remarks. First, that this lecture will be recorded and can be listened to again uh, and seen back uh, uh, via our website, uh, www.mbii.nl. Here you have uh, it written down. And second, that uh, we invite people who would like to ask questions to write them down shortly and clearly on the slips of paper at the desk uh, at the beginning of the break. At the desk there, you can see a box and you can, there are pens and you can write a question down. Please do it right at the beginning of the, of the break. Uh, I am afraid we will not have time to uh, treat all your questions, but in this way, I think it will be possible to deal with as many as possible. But now, please let me introduce tonight's distinguished speaker. It will be difficult to find someone who will be better equipped to speak to us on the subject of synagogue and state in Israel than tonight's lecturer. Not only is he well versed in the Jewish tradition and its sources, and does he find inspiration in Judaism for his thinking? He will also speak to us from an enormous experience in Jewish and Israeli politics. Like his father, Joseph Burg, who served Israel for many decades as minister on behalf of the National Religious Party, he held many leading positions in Jewish and Israeli political life, albeit unlike his father from within secular political parties of the left. He has led the Jewish Agency for Israel and the World Zionist Organization, was for many years a member of the Knesset and for four years speaker of the Knesset. For 20 days, he even fulfilled the role of Israel's acting president. His, records, his record includes successes as cracking the Swiss bank secret to do justice to Holocaust survivors and their families, and forging a concept peace agreement between Israelis and Palestinians, the so-called Geneva Initiative. His religious background and his political experience have led him to reflect much on the theme of synagogue and state, and in particular on its Zionist solution. As is apparent from his recently published book, The Holocaust is Over, We Must Rise from His Ashes. Uh, which deals with the condition of the Jewish state and the way it deals with the Holocaust. He is never afraid to be controversial, neither of changing his mind about certain opinions. And that makes his thinking always profound, original, and therefore highly interesting. I would like to finish this introduction by, expre by expressing my deep gratitude that our speaker has been willing to travel to Amsterdam and share his thoughts with us during a time in Israel that he himself believes cannot, cannot even simply be described with the word difficult. But it is a great honor to have him here under, under any circumstances. I would like to give the floor to Mr. Avraham Borg. Thank you very much, David. I love this introduction. I think it was once Henry Kissinger who was introduced in such a flattering or actually over-flattering manner. And he said, only my parents were here. Um, my father would have loved it and my mother would even believe it. So uh, <laughs> why did you stop? I mean, it was so nice to hear. I didn't know it's about me, but nonetheless. <coughs> I'm very happy to be here. Um, I've been here a couple of times in my, uh, in my life, each and every one of them is, is very significant 
and I'll tell you about two that later on will be at the background at the background of uh, of my introduction. The first time I ever went to Chutzle Aretz, which is traveling abroad, it was when I was at 12th grade. It was 72, 73, and uh, 72 actually. And I went <coughs> and I went to the um, Olympic Games in München, just not to participate, just to watch. And uh, I, the first place I ever touched down outside of Israel was in Amsterdam in Schiphol. And we drove out of the, uh, of the airport. And in the middle of the road, there was some working, uh, working on the road, and there was a big tunnel there. And from the depths of the tunnel, I saw the blonde head of the worker. I walked down of the taxi and I looked for five minutes. Never in my life did I see a blonde man working <laughs> manually with his hands, okay? I never seen, for example, a blonde Arab, okay? So it was for me a shock, a surprise that there is a reality like this. The second time was a decade later, I came in 80, 82, 82, 83, there was a big conference, secret big conference that everybody knew about it and everybody spoke about it, so it was a well-known secret, Jewish one, uh, an interfaith conversation between the Catholic Church and the Jewish people. I don't know who selected the Catholic side, but the Jewish one never agreed with each other on one thing, not even on one thing. It was a very interesting and happened so in Amsterdam. And I've been here many more times. I hope next year to come here to run the marathon. So it's, uh, um, it's a big thing. When we first discussed, David and myself, we first discussed the evening, the issue of church and state, or as you call it, uh, synagogue and, um, and state, uh, maybe it should better be described as Knesset and Beta Knesset, okay, which is maybe the most accurate description of what happens. I thought, well, it's an easy thing. I know more or less what is it. I've been through some of the tricks and some of the drills, and I took a couple of positions about it. There is no problem. I'll come and talk about it. But all of a sudden, you find yourself in a situation in which you have the internal Israeli affairs, and you have the internal Jewish affairs, and then you have between us and our enemies, and between us and the rest of the world, and all of a sudden, the picture is not that flat. The picture is, is much more sophisticated when you listen to the news from Gaza. And let's leave aside the politics of it, and the military maneuvers of it, and, 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 and the casualties, and the suffering, and the human humanitarian dimension and the, and, and the people of our side and their side living under permanent fear. Let's all leave all of this af apart. We all feel that in the last couple of years, the conflict between us and the Palestinians is not anymore just a tribal national conflict between two biblical tribes in the Middle East. It has a deep and getting deeper religious dimension. So all of a sudden, the church and state or religious content of the self is not just me and myself. It is me and myself and me and my adversaries and all of us versus somebody else. So we need a bigger picture. We cannot speak, or I mean, we can, but I don't think it's recommended to speak only about our tiny little, tiny little stone of the mosaic and ignore the rest of the picture. So what I try to do in my introduction, and please believe me, it is very limited, it is very narrow, it is very uh, um, uh, um, contained in comparison to the bigger picture. I try to draw the beginning of the outline of the issue the way I see it, where are we at and where is it going to? And during the question and answers, I heard very carefully and listened very carefully to David's instructions, how to do it, how to write questions, etc. Don't worry. I was so many years in Israeli politics. Never mind what you ask, I anyway give you my answers. So write whatever you like. I have my set of answers to give you anyway, but I'll do my utmost either to answer you or to circumvent you. It depends on the content of the question. Uh, um, somebody once said, what is a good speech? 
A good speech is the one, tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, then tell them what you told them. So let me first tell you what I'm going to tell you, okay? I'm going to talk a little bit about church and state in Israel. What is it? What are the issues? What, are the, what, what, what is the landscape of the question, of the, of the dilemma? And then to go from the Israeli example into a certain part of the world picture. I believe, and I deeply believe so, that Israel in many instances is the microcosm of the world, the same way the world, the world is the macrocosm of Israel. You want to understand the world reality, look into Israel. You want to understand the Israeli reality, look at the world. So moving from the Israeli internal affair or set of affairs, I'll move a little bit outside to between what happens in the world, and then I'll come back to Israel and go back to the world and try to wrap it all together. Church and state, synagogue, Knesset and Beit HaKnesset. Let's begin with simple, let's, let's, let's see if we have the same vocabulary. I will ask a simple question and this is, what is a state? What is a state? What do you, what do you do with this state? What is it? I'll ask you, we have, I don't know how many people we have here, a couple of dozens of people, so we'll have a couple of dozens of answers. The state is for this, the state is for that. There are many answers. One of them is a state is a tool in the hands of the people. It's a tool which its purpose is to organize people's life, sewage system, education, economy, security, you name it, how you organize the life of the people. This is a simple answer. But when you ask this question in Israel, all of a sudden it's not that simple. Because when you come to my cousins and tell them, listen, the state of Israel is like a tool. The state of Israel is like a watch. The state of Israel is like a podium, is like a jar of water. The state of Israel is just an instrument that tell you what, Avram, are you out of your mind? The state of Israel is just a tool? The state of Israel is just a, 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 a materialistic uh, a, 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 a subject? No way. Because every Shabbat morning, every Saturday morning, when we bring the Torah back to the arch and we pray the prayers for the, for the, for, for the peace and the betterment of the state of Israel, we say the follows. Avinu Shabbashamayim, our good Lord in heaven, Barechet Medinat Israel, please bless the state of Israel, the dawn of our redemption. The, the state of Israel, in the eyes of many, in the eyes maybe of the majority, is not just an indifferent secular tool in the hands of the people to organize our daily, current, contemporary life, but a state of Israel in the eyes of many is the beginning of, beginning of our redemption. It has a redemptive, eschatological, maybe even messianic dimension and ingredients built in into the very identity of the state. So the state of Israel is not just an indifferent tool. The state of Israel has some religious messianic element factor in its very identity. And let's say we don't really know what is the answer, whether it's a tool or messianic state, and you can already see the beginning of the landscape of the political reality in Israel, how so many of the seculars will say, yes, it is just a tool in the hands of the people. And so many of the religious segments, especially religious Zionism, will say, well, it is a tool plus the religious messianic agenda. Assuming we solve this problem, comes the next one. I ask you, whatever the state is, a tool or a messianic one, what's the source of authority of this state? Let's take Netherlands. I'll ask you, what is the source of authority of Netherlands? Many will say we have no idea. Okay, but those who have any kind of an idea will tell you there is something like, I have a will, and you have a will, and she has a will, and all of them over there have a will, and we together create a kind of a virtual common will. And we are human beings here and now, 
We are the source of authority of ourselves. We decide for ourselves what are we, what are our priorities, what do we, prior, what do we prefer and what do we negate, what do we accept and what do we do reject. We are the human beings. We are the source of authority of ourselves. When I bring this formula to my family again, my cousins will tell you, what are you again out of your mind? And they say time and again, I mean, don't worry about it. I mean, that's part of the permanent conversation at home. They will tell me, how can you, a Jewish traditional individual, be fully committed to human beings? We are fully committed to the one and only ultimate, never mistaken source of authority. So you look at this state of Israel and you look at the square, at one hand you have a tool or a messianic state, human source of authority or a divine source of authority. And in between these four corners of the Israeli structure, you can find many explanations to many expressions of what you see happens at the church and state issues in Israel. And into that, I'd like to factor one other constitutional dimension before I move forward. We love, the defini we love to define Israel, and it is so expressed in its laws and books of law, that Israel is a Jewish, dem Jewish democratic state. Now it sounds so great. I mean, two at the price of one. Not only democracy, but Jewish as well. That's perfect. I mean, that's like a good sale, 50%. And it sounds good, and everybody's happy about it. Very few people pay attention to the volatility of the formula. When you say that the state is a democratic state, again, it is what we spoke here. We are the source of authority of ourselves. But when you say it is not just a democracy, it is Jewish as well. And according to some of the laws, the responsibility for the interpretation of what is the Jewishness of the Jewish element in this formula is delegated to Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox guardians, you realize that what we spoke earlier about the potential collision between democracy and theocracy, between synagogue and state between Knesset and Beta Knesset is a built-in element into the very definition of the state of Israel. Now, thank God, we have the Arabs. Imagine one day a tragedy will happen and the Arabs will declare peace. No more war, no more bloodshed, put down the swords, put down the missiles, put down the animosity, put down the, 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 the violence. We don't want anything, just Israel, deal with yourself. How long do you think it will take the Israeli society to erupt into this collision between church and state, between the Jewish and the democratic element? And if you'll add to that one more element, that since a significant part of the Jewish definition of the state of Israel, as I said before, is messianic, and you remember our history, that each and every time Jewish politics met and merged with Jewish messianism, it ended up in a catastrophe. You see why somebody like myself take, takes a very, very harsh and hard position against the definition of the state of Israel as a Jewish democratic state. It's volatile. That's our chapter, some elements of the landscape. Let's move forward. The problem is not ours only. Our problem is part of a larger debate around the world historically. There are some nations who solved the problem many years ago. There are some nations or faith who did not yet solve the problem. There are some who do not yet know they have a problem. But the conversation is there. Now, when the wall came down in Berlin, by the end of the, of the 80s, there were two papers put on the table of the world for discussion. One was Francis Fukuyama, The End of History. Let's wait for it. I mean, 
it's not tomorrow, so I don't really I don't really care about it. And the other was the late Samuel Huntington, The Clash of Civilizations. Later on become an international bestseller. Beside the fact that I personally was very insulted that Huntington does not consider Judaism as, as a civilization, like my mother did not, because she said you are very uncivilized. Uh, he has a very interesting argument. Says Huntington, says Huntington that if I can characterize the conflicts of the 19th and the 20th century as a political conflicts between states and nations over economic and geographical ter 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 territorial uh, interests, the conflicts to come over the 21st century and on will not have this nature at all, but they're going to be conflicts between faith and culture, clash of civilizations. And the first potential conflict waiting around the corner, knocking on our door, is the conflict between democristianity and Islam. He said that by the end of the 80s, and George W. Bush adopted it as a prophecy and said, if this is the world picture, if this is the reading of the world, so I'm going to head, especially after September 11th, the legions of Children of Light's crusade. So somebody else said, welcome, Richard Lionheart. I'm Saladin, let's fight. And in no time, an 800 years old unhealed wound is bleeding again. And I ask myself, is that really the reading of the world picture through the prism of church and state? Or is it, or is it too simplistic? Is it too flat? Is it really that it's all of them versus all of us? When you say billion and some Muslims are all Bin Laden, you actually say that billion and some of us are all George W. Bush. And I'm not. I'm hardly myself. How can I be such a great man? <laughs> and I must look into something else. So I feel and I intellectually know that there is a clash of civilization in the world. But it's a different clash of, it's a different, the partition line goes some other place. And here I go back to our example of earlier of the Israeli case. The clash of civilizations in the world today, I think, is the clash between the democratic civilization and the theocratic civilization. <laughs> Again, the citizens of the democratic civilizations are people like us who are fully committed to a human source of authority, and the citizens of the theocratic source of authority are those who are fully committed to the divine discipline. Now, all of a sudden, if this is the clash, it is not all of us versus all of them, but it's a, dif a bit different because this clash is happening within Judaism, within Christianity and within Islam. This clash is happening between Jewish fundamentalists, be it messianic or just religious fundamentalists, and Jewish democratic liberals and humanitarians. It happens within Christianity between evangelical fundamentalists and Democrats and liberals, and it happens within Islam. If this is the division, which is not just all of us versus all of them, it brings me to a very, very delicate place. The conflict or the conflicts are not anymore just me against you, but it is some of us with some of them and some of them against versus some of us and some of them and some of them. Very complicated. Last, last year, I put a book on the Israeli table for discussion. Did I have a discussion? Ah, that was a great polemic. And everybody argued and everybody shouted. And to tell you the truth, I loved it. I love polemics. I believe that if there is God up there in heaven, God created the world with polemics. 
that's a tool of creation. Because if you agree with me, and I agree with you, and all of us agree with them, it's a boring, castrated place. No new thing can be born among people of permanent consent on everything. But if you disagree with me, and I argue with you, and I sharpen my position on your opposition, and you perfect your opposition against my position, some Hegelian thing is born between the two of us, some synthesis of some kind. So polemic is a tool of creation, very important for me at least, and therefore I love agreements and disagreements, and sometimes when I agree with myself, I disagree with myself. And about this, when everybody shouted at me last year or two years ago when I put this on the table and argued all of these arguments, I said one thing among many. I said personally, 60 years after the Holocaust, I personally, emotionally, ideologically, and morally cannot accept the Israeli law which genetically defines Jews or genetically only defines Jews. Who is a Jew and one who was born to, to, to a Jewish mother? It's not enough for me because for me, Judaism is not about genetics. Judaism is about a value system. It was very difficult for people to understand the abstract of what I'm arguing. So I said, I'll give you a Talmudic dilemma. Talmudic-like dilemma. You walk down the river and two people are drowning and you can save one only. Now listen, no deals, no half of this one and part of that one. No, I take this one first and come for the other one later. One only. That's, that's the essence of the dilemma. You can jump for one only. One is Rabbi Kahana and the other one is the Dalai Lama. For whom you jump? For whom you jump? I jump for the Dalai Lama because the Dalai Lama is my Jewish brother sharing the same values, the same Jewish values of morality and humanity and generosity and universalism and kindness and compassion and all of that. And Rabbi Kahana is part of the coalition of my adversaries and enemies of religious fundamentalists who do not have room and respect for the other who is not like him. This is an upgrade of Huntington's clash of civilizations. And if this is the case, world picture is a bit different. When I speak about this world picture, I would like for a minute to come back to us and then open it again, as I told you. I travel a lot abroad. And I walk the streets and I listen to the talk I talk to people and people talk to me. Usually, I try not to have Abba Ibn style talk. Abba Ibn was once invited for a kind of a dialogue. And after he spoke for four hours with his brilliant, perfect English, somebody told him, Mr. Ibn, you listen only when your mouth is open. And I try to listen with some other organs as well. And I see in many street corners, especially at high time like this one, a graffiti equation. A star of David equals swastika. And I ask myself, what is it? What is it? What this graphic is telling me? I understand the anger. I understand the populism. I understand the media. I understand and I understand and I understand. But is there something deeper? I'd like to offer a text be, be, behind this graffiti. And again, it goes to the issue of a state and a religion. A different angle, still very important. I feel that the state of Israel is a real theological challenge to the Christian dogma, especially the Catholic one. And it goes this way. God blessed us many, many years ago when he was young and we were young and everybody knew what blessing is all about. Now we are old, we forget, we don't remember the details, but we were blessed. And then happened what happened. And according to the new church, to the New Testament, 
God removed his blessing from the Old Testament, from the old church Israelites, the Israelis, and gave it to the new church. Dogmatically speaking, from Paulus and on, Augustinus and on, the Christian dogma or elements or important parts of Christian dogma needed the humiliated Jewish people as a living testimony to the greatness of the God new blessing. So all during the years, in so many places, we were humiliated, we were poor and meek, but never totally and absolutely annihilated because if you kill or you perish the witness, who will give the testimony? And these were the relations, Judea and Captiva. Then came the Holocaust, and the world realized, and when I say the world, I mean in the, in the, in the center of this world was the European American Christianity, that the, one, the way to solve the Jewish problem and the issue of the Jews is to grant the Jews a state. And for the first time since the establishment of this dogma of humiliation, we got a state. And then a disaster happened. We succeeded. Imagine I am a Christian dogma, dog dogmatist. I look at the blessed state of Israel with all the problems, wars and conflicts and controversies. It's an unbelievable place. Great economy. The shekel is stronger than the dollar. Unbelievable universities, high tech, arts, whatever you like, literature, poetry. It's a great uh, military ability, uh, skills, agriculture, you name it. It's a real place, looks like a blessed place. What does that mean? That God re-removed his blessing from the new church and gave it back to the old church? What do we do about it? How do I look at the state of Israel religiously if I need the Jews down there and all of a sudden they're up here? What does this expression of a blessed reality mean for me dogmatically? Many facing the issue and the depths of dialogues and the depths of conversation and the changes, the very slow changes of the, do of the dogmas of Christianity more than Judaism, but nonetheless is, is, is toward the right direction and the church is a slow mover. But for many, it's a problem. And when I spoke to some people who know something about how, who put this swastika in place and I went to so many places of skinheads and this kind of people talking to them, trying interviewing for my writing, for my understanding, they tell me, listen, we gave you, we gave you, we granted you the state because of the Holocaust. You succeeded all of this description. Now, if we will succeed to persuade our people that what you do is Nazi-like crimes, it's a reason to take away the state for you, from you and resolve our internal built-in conflict. It is there. It's one state and one church but it's a set of relations of Israel with the rest of the world as well. And there is a religious dimension. It's not the only one. It's not the major one, but it is there as a background language, as a background nose at the relationship. And then it brings me to the next thing. I look at Europe today. I understand the concerns. I understand the streets. I see the threats and I feel the, op the missed opportunities. And again, it's about church and state. It's about faith and religion. Europe, for the first time in, in its history, is compromising the white Christian supremacy. There are today in Europe 25 million Muslims. And if and when Turkey will join the European Union, there will be something like 100 million Muslims within wider Europe. That's huge. That's big. That's a challenge. I've been by the end of 99, I think, I was in Sweden and I had a session with the Prime Minister uh, Purston and he said, you know, by the beginning or by the end of next year, Sweden is going for a separation between church and state. 
I said, why is it? He said, because 8% of the Swedes are not anymore from Swede origin. They do not belong to the Swedes church. So we must separate. There is no homogeneous Sweden anymore. So we have to separate between church and state. He meant the Muslim immigrants and many others. And it happens all over the place, politically, religiously, culturally, in the streets, etc., etc. What will be the attitude of the old world, the first world, to this new tidal wave of, re of religious immigration to Europe is the key to the future of the world. A key to the future of the world. Why is that? When I see the rising of the xenophobic, anti-Semite, political right in Europe, I know that somebody is offering a solution. Late Mr. Heider in Austria, Jean-Marie Le Pen in France, Blocher in Switzerland. What happens here, you know better than I do. Somebody is offering a solution. Somebody is saying ideologically and globally, because it's all over the place, Europe should be free of foreigners. It's about xenophobia and our solution for xenophobia, you know exactly what is it. Kick them out of Europe. I did not yet see the other side reacting. I did not yet see the liber liberal, humanitarian, universalistic side standing up opening its arms and welcoming the non-Christian element into Europe. Now, what am I talking about? I read a lot about the encounter between Christianity and democracy of a couple of centuries ago. It was bitter. It was bloody. It was violent. Eventually, a kind of a new equilibrium was achieved. I know firsthand what happened and what is happening to Judaism whilst it met for the first time and ever since it's an ongoing process with modernity, enlightenment, and democracy and liberties. Changed religion, changed faith, changed civilization, changed culture. We are a different Jewish people than the Jewish people of 400 years ago, 300 years ago. Because of this merger, because of this synthesis with the new cultural forces of the world. What will happen if in 100 years down the road, 200 years down the road, we shall have a Western world Islam? If we shall have a European Islam that on one hand will be very traditional and fully committed to its own traditions and rites and rituals, like I am to mine, like George Bush to his, and at the same time will absorb and internalize the very foundations of Western civilizations, freedoms, liberties, equality, etc., etc. What will that do? That we shall have 30 million, 100 million people thinking like that and sending letters back home to Gaza or back home to Tehran or back home to wherever it is saying the big devil is not that diabolic. It's a different thing. Now, will Europe reject the new other, the Muslim? Or will Europe open a dialogue with the new other? That's a key to a future. It's a key to a future here. It's a key to a future in the Middle East. It's a key to a future all around the world. Unfortunately, I do not yet see it. I do not yet see this conversation. I do not yet see this dialogue. I see the rejectionist. I do not see the, those who accept. Why do I say it? Because I see a role for me as a Jewish civilization into this conversation, and I come back to the very opening remarks of ours. I left politics five years ago because of many reasons. I wanted to speak out. I wanted to say exactly what I feel without doing any compromises with all the Shimon Perises around. I wanted to be myself. And Shimon Peres is always around and will always be around Till 2020, I mean, to his 2020, not ours, okay? I wish him all well, but I felt 
I felt something is wrong. What I felt about the Israeli politics at the time was <coughs> that Israel became a very efficient kingdom with no prophecy. We lost the direction. Now, the way I was brought up, the way my parents brought up, my two sisters and myself, was a way which said Judaism is not about survival. We are not, we do not survive in order to survive. We do not exist in order to exist. We do not continue in order to continue. Every cat can survive in order to survive. So it's a circumcised cat, so what? This is not an issue. We were brought up as, you, as Jews who believe in utopia, and I'm a utopian, saying Judaism is about a higher call. Sometimes you don't see the higher quality of your generation, but when you look backwards, you see what happened. Look at the slavery in Egypt. We were enslaved there for 400 very long years. And then out of nowhere, erupted the shout, the cry, the outcry, let my people go, which echoes up until today. That was the call of liberty in times of enslavement. That was a higher call. Then we were in, 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 mythologically, we were in the Sinai Desert and got the Ten Commandments, the first ever human to human constitution setting the relationship between people and people. You read the prophets, the just society they were looking for. You listen to Maimonides of the Middle Ages. He was there, a small, persecuted, humiliated religion representing the, 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 the poor Judaism a dust to the feet of the huge daughters of it, Christianity and Islam. And when he's being asked and he's dreaming about redemption, and when he's being asked, what is redemption for you? What is messianic day for you? He doesn't speak about Lubavitch Rebbe. He says one thing only. He says the only difference between our now days of being oppressed and messianic days, Ein ben yameinu ele limot ha-mashiach, ela she'abud malchuyot bilvad, that by the end of the days, the days that we as Jews are looking for and striving for, there will be no oppression of nations. Nations will not oppress nations. People will not occupy people. Individuals will not abuse individuals. That's a higher call. That's why I live as a Jew. And when you ask me, Avram, what is the higher call of nowadays? I have a very simple one, but I think it's an important one. A teacher of mine said the two kinds of Jews came out of Auschwitz, or two kinds of people came out of Auschwitz. Those who said, never again, never again for Jews. Let's have the thickest walls around us. Let's have the deepest shelter underneath us. Let's defend ourselves to our teeth, never again for Jews. And few of us who came out and said, never again to any human beings. My experience as a victim, my experience as the persecuted, my experience as the other, all during these years, is a higher call for me to help any victim, any persecuted individual, wherever he or she are, to have my attention to wake up, to, to, to raise a voice as a wake-up call for the world. Don't be indifferent now like you've been indifferent 60 years ago. That's my role, that being aware and sensitive to the victims of the world wherever they are. And when I see Europe today not sensitive enough for the current potential conflict of Muslims, Muslim immigrants, and tradition, and veteran Europeans, so to say, I'd like to offer my services as yesterday's other. I'd like to say, if you resolve it there, it will help me over there. And I'm ready to make peace with their prices over there in order to help the world to resolve its problems over here, because the picture is one. The conflict in, the, in Gaza and in the Middle East is the conflict in the streets of Amsterdam and Gaza, is the conflict of the Twin Towers and, the, and Bin Laden in New York. It's the same conflict all over the world. 
globalization and no borders for culture and sports and politics and music and philosophy is a no is a culture of globalization of no borders for religions and faith as well and who is better who is better equipped and more experienced than the jewish people to contribute something to this newly emerging front of our eyes new global world a world in which everybody is equal but everybody should be sensitive as well thank you very much Thank you very much for this uh, beautiful lecture in uh, which I'm afraid you confirmed quite a lot of what I said about you in my introduction. Um, we are going to have a break now of uh, about half an hour, so I would like to ask you to be back here at um, um, 9.30. And you can uh, uh, write down questions if you want to. And cursed shall thou be when thou wart out. Yah shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them, and flee seven ways before them. And thou shalt... Already 20 to 10, so um, I think it would be uh, good to start... Um, with uh, with the questions, um, and I would like to start by uh, one main question that that has been asked by different people, um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll actually I have three three slips of paper that have maybe the same question you phrased in different ways. Uh, that no? that's that's okay. up to you. The first, the, the first question is the neutral question, and uh, that's and I'm sure many uh, many people in the audience would like to hear a little bit more about that, and that's uh, what is your opinion on the current situation in Gaza? <laughs> uh, the second question is uh, I'll read to you, and that is how can you give such a totally theoretical lecture at this very moment, ignoring that the whole population is being slaughtered in Gaza? by Jan Elshout, whereas there is somebody else whose name I cannot read, I have to uh, say, uh, phrase the question, how can one have a dialogue with people that don't want to have a dialogue with members of a religion that is essentially monopolistic, oppressive, and doesn't tolerate other views? You mean Jewish orthodoxy? <laughs> <laughs> no. But basically, what, what, what do you think of... Basically, of I got a picture, in, I got a question, Gaza, okay? Yeah. Um, Galit, where are you? Where are you? Galit uh, addressed me at, the, um, at a break and said, how dare you, how dare you uh, give such an abstract lecture about this and that when the situation is like that? And I apologized and said, listen, I'm coming from a German region. And I was invited to speak about this and not about that. <laughs> and since I'm not in politics anymore, and in politics, you know, somebody once said, a friend of my, a colleague of my father once said that for a politician, a mic is like a tree for the puppy. When you see it, you do something about it, okay? So as a politician, you use every opportunity to say whatever you like, regardless of the topic and regardless of the, uh, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the definition of the event. But I came here for a very uh, specific purpose, 
And I didn't know what's the politics of the people, and I didn't. And I thought that people did not come for my politics, but I came for this topic. So I respected the topic. Now that you want me to be an Israeli, I'll be. Okay, there is no problem. I'll tell you what I think about the situation. And if I have to use a, a very delicate and, and 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 careful words, I will say it's a lousy situation. Now, I take it that any country and any government has the responsibility to defend its, its, its citizens. And no government can tolerate a violation of its sovereignty. Imagine a remote place in Netherlands, not Amsterdam. What's happening again, okay? <laughs> that for eight years, every day, 10 bombs. Just 10 bombs, nothing more. I mean, that's okay. You get used to it. It's fun. I mean, you can gamble, you can have a casino there. I mean. It, but nobody can tolerate it. Even the very composed, relaxed, uh, layer back uh, Dutchman, by the end of the day, will say to the government, do something about it. So every government has the right and sometimes even the responsibility to do something about it. <coughs> the question is, is everything legitimate? Or as Michael Walzer once wrote, what are just wars and what are unjust wars? Very difficult to answer. I'll tell you an anecdote. My father used to say my father was a very, very smart man, and very sophisticated and very funny and a good father. He used to tell the story about Moshe, who was battered to death by the Goy, by the non-Jew. And the Hevre, his friends came to hospital to visit him and ask him, Moshe, what happened? He said, what happened? What happened? I'll tell you what happened. It all started when the guy kicked me back. <laughs> now, the easiest thing is, the easiest thing is to say, ah, they dropped for a couple of years, they dropped a couple of shells and rockets on Sterot. Now we give them back. And then you ask, why did they drop this on Sterot? Ah, because of the up, and now let, let, let's take the picture rather than the details. On principle, I believe that once a country, once a state, once a society goes to a war, it already failed. A war is an expression of failure of exercising all the other alternatives. Sometimes because you didn't try, sometimes because you tried and you failed. But a war is the last resort, and if you use it, you fail. Even when you go to a war, there are different qualities to this violent engagement. If the result of the war is just a waiting period for the next war, you failed again. If the result of the conflict and the animosity is the beginning of a conversation, maybe there is something good there. 73 was a lousy war, was it a, 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 a horrific and horrific traumatic experience for the state of Israel. But historically speaking, this trauma brought about Camp David and the peace with Egypt. So the package is not that bad. The first intifada with the Palestinians was bloody and difficult and complicated and challenging and traumatic and painful, but it brought to Oslo. Never mind why Oslo failed, but out of the conflict came something positive. I asked myself about Gaza. The motivation of the Israelis and the motivation of the Palestinians and the motivation of all the other cynical players like the Egyptians are so happy that we do, the, we do the deeds for them, and the PLO are so happy that we do the job for them, and for some European governments as well. What is the outcome of Gaza? Do I have, at least on the Israeli side, forget about the other side because I'm not responsible for the other side. Do I really trust my government to come out, to come out of, the, of this engagement with talks with the Hamas 
or the re resumption of the talks with the PLO? Unfortunately, the answer is no. Therefore, the war is a bad war. It's just a war which is going to bring more war. It is just an act of hostility which is going to give birth to more hostility. And therefore, I cannot accept it. Therefore, I cannot tolerate it. Yes, it's the right of my government to defend me. It could have and it should have and it shall and must defend me first by dialogue and conversation and peace and understanding and reconciliation rather than investing more hatred. And that's unfortunately, I feel, what is happening in Gaza now. I'm so. How else can you react? Can I what? React. Is that a legitimate question? I mean, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> he who must be obeyed. Eh, eh, eh. What's the alternative? Uh, what, what should um, uh, what should Israel be doing, in your opinion, now about the situation? Let me touch just one thing because the issue is so wide and so big and so old, and you know, and you can begin it at every any given moment, okay? I ask myself, intellectually, why don't we want to talk to the Hamas? Why do they not, they do not talk to me? It's their problem, it's not mine, okay? Why do I not talk to the Hamas? Short of that, why do I not seriously talk to the PLO and even at the time that I could talk to the PLO, I did my utmost to destroy them? Why? One of the reasons is because I cannot talk to them about things I cannot speak with myself about. And there is at least one issue that I have to talk to myself before I go to talk to the others. Can Israel seriously engage itself in any peace process, understanding that by the end of the process, it has to remove all the settlements from the occupied territories? If I cannot agree with myself that that might be the end result of the peace process, I do not go to the process. And at each and every time we have been there, we diluted ourselves and we deceived our adversaries, saying, yes, we are going to do something about it. But even in Oslo, which was a euphoric appearance out of nowhere, at the time of the beginning of Oslo to the end of Oslo, Israel doubled the size and the quantity of settlements and settlers in the heart of the occupied territories. Now, as long as I'm afraid from the internal trauma and do not want to talk about it with myself, I cannot talk about it with the other. You ask me what is to be done? What is to be done is first Israel to decide what it's ready to do and then find partners for this. Now, there is a window of opportunity there. As much as some of them do not like me or do not like us, they despise Iran, Shiite fundamentalism, and Sunnah and Sunni uh, 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 Muslim brothers and Hamas fundamentalism more than they are concerned about me. And the potential coalition of us and Egypt and maybe Syria, and has its prices, and Jordan and Turkey is a potential coalition yet to be tested. They call it the Saudi Initiative, the Arab League resolution that Israel said time and again, no, and no, and no, and no, and no. And I believe, as I said here, it is not anymore all of us versus all of them. It is some of them and some of us versus some of them and some of, of them. And therefore, I believe that the beginning of the resolution is not Gaza. It's not even us and the Palestinians. It's us and the Arab world around us. And the offer was offered by them, not by us. And I, as up, to, up until now, we rejected it and prefer arrogant, cowboy-style unilateral measures like the unilateral withdrawal from Gaza, which is wrong. In a, in a place in which you can talk and you do unilateral acts, you cannot blame the one who fills the vacuum. You are the one who created the vacuum. So it's about dialogue, it's not about arrogance.
Okay, uh, I, I would like to go back to uh, the, the, um, the uh, religion and state um, issue. By, uh, with a I don't question. know which one I prefer. <laughs> okay. Uh, a question by Elon Heymans, uh, um, who wrote, you have explained the problems of religion and state from the perspective from the state. But what is the attitude of religion towards the state? And what should the state be from the per perspective of religion? Yeah, the two Jews walking toward each other in the streets of Tel Aviv. And one is holding two gigantic watermelons under his armpits. And the other one is asking him, excuse me, do you know where's Bialik Street? So he said, will you hold the watermelons for a minute? So he takes the watermelon and he says, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> now, will you hold the watermelons for a minute? <laughs> and I tell you, I'll, 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 I'll address the question, you know, in a very limited way from two different angles. The first one is the current state of affairs and the other one from my utopian dream, so to say, or the way I understand the role of religion within a state in, 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 in Judaism. The state of Israel is at the best so far a first degree organizational restructure of the Jewish people. Yes, we were in exile, and now we have sovereignty. It's a good structural change. I do not yet see the theological reform and the new thinking of Jewish dogma to this new creature we call the State of Israel. Now, I understand the problem of religion there. Never mind whether it is the ultra-orthodox, orthodox, conservative, uh, uh, reform, reconstructionist, all of the above, none. Okay, whatever it is, I understand the problem. Because in Judaism, you have actually two prototypes. You have the kingdom of David that has been, and the kingdom of Messiah, son of David, to come. You don't have a third way, which is not religious, not messianic, very secular in its attitude, most of its attitudes. There is no definition for this. You don't even have a definition in Judaism for a Jewish people that its majority does not keep Shabbat, does not eat kosher, does not keep the purity of the family, but kisses mezuzah. <laughs> the neo-Jewish people with this new third, third political entity called the State of Israel is too much of a challenge to a getting, to ghettoizing itself religious thinking within Judaism. So you don't yet see the openness and the acceptance of the new political reality of the Jews. So this is what you see now. You ask me, okay, Avram, it's in your hands. What would you like to see? How would you like to see it? So I'm, I, I feel I made it clear already that for me, a state, any state, be it the United States of America, be it Netherlands, be it Israel, is just a secular tool, a secular instrument in the hands of the people. And religion shouldn't have any role to play with statehood and with statehood, with statehood and state's instruments. The place of religion, the place of faith is within the community. And more than that, the role of religion and the role of religiosity and the role of faith and the role of the clergyman is not to be part of the system is not to be part of the government, is not to be part of the authority, but to be the opposition to the malicious deeds and acts done by the government. My role model is Nathan the prophet. Here is King David. He's walking up his penthouse in Jerusalem, and down there at the low-income neighborhood, 
He saw a beautiful girl, a woman, I'm sorry, taking a shower on her roof. It's a custom in Jerusalem up until today. <laughs> Especially in mass sharim and places like this, okay? So he is actually exercising his royal, uh, his royal rights and confiscate this woman. And she becomes his lover, then his wife, then the mother of King Solomon. In the middle of the process, he succeeds to make her husband die, killed. Comes Nathan the prophet. And remember, it's not the state of Israel of today that you can say whatever you like. And there is no place like Israel today with the freedom of speech. Even I can say whatever I like in Israel, okay? It's fine. It's it's the ancient time. I mean, if you take a position against the, 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 the king, by the end of the day, your mouth is separated from your body. Stands, king, stands Nathan the prophet against the king and tells him, you are, you should be sentenced to death. Ben Mavet Atta. He tells him, I'm going to kill you if not me, the good Lord in heaven. Why? Because my role as a prophet is to be the defender of the helpless, of the needy. The role of the rabbi or the role of the, uh, 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 of the holy man or holy person is to be the side of the widow, of the battered women, of the minority, of the other. Against the malicious deeds and acts of the government to be the opposition, the moral opposition rather than to be the immoral concubine of the political system. And what happened in Israel, tragically so in the last 60 years, as my teacher and mentor Isaiah Leibovitch said, religion became the mistress, the concubine of politics in Israel. And the unholy alliance between the two corrupted both systems. Religion is corrupted by politics, and politics is corrupted by, by, by manipulative religion. And if there will not be a separation between church and state in Israel, I'm sorry, between Knesset and Beta Knesset in Israel, there is no future for any importance, spiritual significance of Judaism in the Jewish society in Israel. Um, and, uh, uh, uh... Uh, a question by uh, Gary Feingold, uh, what, uh, which, which has been asked more. What does the recent banning of Arab political parties in Israel say about the state of democracy there? Is it a facade completely? We are very tolerant, considerable, accepting the other, respecting the difference. <laughs> it's a shame. What do you mean, where are you? I mean, it's a shame. Never mind it's a shame voted by the right. It's a shame voted by the Labour Party. And I'm, I'm telling you the truth. I'm, I pray, simply pray for the Supreme Court again to turn back this decision. It's simply a shame, especially in times like this. Um, okay, next question. Um, do you consider Israel to be mainly a product of the Holocaust or of the millennia-old desire of the Jewish people again to have a state of their own? It's a question by Jacob Polak. Both. Both. <laughs> that's the answer, or...? No, that's the long version. <laughs> You want to sort? You, you want to... Uh, well, that's my answer. I, mean, I would well, like to... Oh, you okay, want to... No, no, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, if, um, then this is a nice question um, um, by uh, Mordi, I think. Uh, and uh, it, it's... Uh, is there any future in Israeli politics to someone who published a book such as yours? And perhaps the question is also... I hope not. Is, is, is there, do, <laughs> well, do, do you hope, uh, do, do you have plans uh, for, uh, um, for let's returning go politics? Let's, let's go back to Jacob's question, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, um, now, me, now me, in politics, me in politics, the story is over. 
The story is over because I believe I served something like quarter of a century, which is half of my life, the Israeli public. And I really do not believe that you should stay there forever. You should make room for others. And that's about the renewal, needed much more renewal of the political system. You serve, and then you have to move forward, and some new forces and new energies and new ideas and new, and new inputs should be introduced into politics. And I do not really believe that I was, uh, um, that I was chosen to be in, uh, all of my life, or t till the rest of my life, a member of Knesset. That's not about this. And you should retire when you're still in power and you have some stamina instead of waiting there to the end of your days and being kicked out shamely out of the system. Having said that, um, I will say the follows. Whenever I'm being asked, this question is being asked in Israel, I whisper to myself, listen carefully, listen carefully. Because I came with what is being perceived today as quite iconoclastic uh, new thinking about many variations about church and state, about the rule, the centrality of the trauma in our life, about the way to trust and to dialogue and to have a conversation with our neighbors, my, my full ultimate commitment to peace and peace process, my trust of my enemies, etc., etc., etc. All of these uh, uh, um, left-wing cliches and naivetes. And I put it on the Israeli table for discussion the minute I put it there, both my first book and my second book, my next one will be less controversial, unfortunately, but what can I do? Um, the minute it was out, I was very happy because it indicated to me that the Israeli society is still a very vibrant living reality. But at the same time, when people ask me this question, I say, if they believe that a day will come and I'll still be alive to see it, that these kind of ideas will be legitimately represented in the Knesset, so I'm not the last of the optimists. Now, what happened to me in the last year and a half, it's more than that, but the last year and a half it was intensified, was very interesting. Many of the people I lost and many of the people who cannot see me anymore are Mr. Israeli. There are 50 plus secular, middle and upper middle class, voted labor. You see the stereotype? More or less what I'm talking about. When I come with this kind of messages, they say, Avram, what? Now that we are well off, shut up. Don't come with your earthquake questions. Shut up, just go away, disappear, vanish. But three times a week, I meet groups of youngsters from 17 years old, which is right before the military service, to early parenthood, which is around 27, 28, 29, 30, coming and asking to see me and say, we do not necessarily agree with your answers, but you are the first one who opened to us the gates or the doors toward asking questions we always wanted to ask and nobody permitted us. And it's the first polemic and the same, the first controversy in my life. And I was involved in so many that has a generational dimension. And my new constituency, my new conversation is not with, it's not with the entire younger generation, but with a significant and very qualitative uh, uh, element of this younger generation. And there I'm very, very hopeful so I'm not at all sure, I'm sure I will not anymore run again for the Knesset, but my ideas and my spirits and spirits of others will be very soon be heard differently by the younger generation when they will assume responsibility over the fate of the state of Israel. And uh, are you engaged in any way in the, in the next elections? Uh, uh, in yes, the, in I will campaigns? vote. You will vote? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm very much encouraging, and I'm one of the founders of the new uh, left peace movement. And may I ask what you will vote? Yeah, the this, one I support. Movement. Yeah, okay. Okay, for a change, I'll, I'll vote for those I support. <laughs> okay, no, I'll vote for the new left uh, left peace for peace uh, merits uh, movement. Okay. Uh, another question. Um, how can you expect a damaged people like the Jewish people to be wiser and more tolerant people than other people? 
Isn't that arrogant? Is the Jewish people not a people that can psychologically not be the ones to make peace? Give up on security. It's a question by Miriam Cohen. Getting... What, what was the last word? Getting on security? Uh, give up on security. Give up. You know, it's the third or fourth question already which offers me an either-or alternative. Either you have security or you make peace. Either you're traumatized or you're generous. Either you are meek or you're arrogant. I'm not at that age anymore of either or. I'm much more into this and that as well. So when it comes to security, I do not believe that strategically there is a better security for Israel than peace. I see all of these wars and I see all of these conflicts and all of this animosity. Did it bring more security or less security? Yes, I have a very powerful army, but I feel much less secure. What is the best border I have in, around me? It's the border with Egypt, which I have peace there. What was the best period between me and the Palestinians? Was the period in which Oslo was still a promising thing rather than a failing dream? Can the people who were victims, how was it the people who were victims can, some can, some cannot, some forever, will be within the trauma. I mean, part of the book I wrote, having in front of my eyes a couple of female friends of mine, that one was raped, the other was abused, and the other one had some other traumas. Two out of the three will never come out of the trauma. Never. Because it's, it's too much. One of them will. If this is the case with individuals, it might be the case with collectives. It might be a collective that was severely abused and seriously violated and therefore will never come out of the trauma. I take it painfully for granted. But if one, and one part of the people, one part of the collective is able to overcome the trauma and to benefit, if I can say, to benefit from the pain into helping others, so maybe this is it. Maybe this is the historic dialectic responsibility. Will all the people be there? No. If part of the people will be there, that's a promising promise for me. That's enough. These are the people I'm addressing. Uh, may maybe the question is also uh, a bit aimed at your understanding of Judaism and what Jews are and uh, whether you see them uh, as maybe the, the, the person who asked the question uh, understood as uh, people, and I quote, that are wiser, more tolerant than other people. We? Oui. Personally, I agree, but... Uh, <laughs> you know, we are living in a world of stereotypes. For many years, I commuted between Israel and the United States of America, American Jewry. And I watched these stereotypes of we believe that they are all rich and they believe that we are all heroes and unfortunately only 50% of it is true. So <laughs> are we the wisest people around? Yes, but the Chinese are wise and the Japanese are wise and the Nigerians are wise and everybody is tolerant. I do not believe in this arrogant approach that I'm better than. I do my utmost to be a better person. I do my utmost to improve myself. I do my utmost to repair the world around me, to tikkun olam. Do I do it better than others? No. Should I cooperate with others? Yes. Can I enrich others? Yes. Can others can other enrich me? The answer is yes. One of the things that made so many Israelis angry at me is that I said, and I, and I really believe in it, that there is a danger that the state of Israel will endanger my Jewish existential being. And I'll try to explain it. <clears throat> Imagine that we are playing Monopoly. You have Monopoly in Netherlands, okay? Well, you buy hotels, yes, yeah, you buy streets, yes. you go to jail. 
Okay. You, you buy the street over there. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, exactly. Yes. You buy this street, and yes. my prime minister goes to jail. Okay, and and we play monopoly. And in this monopoly, I have the opportunity to bring the entire Jewish people, every one of the 14 million people, to Israel. No problem with Gaza. No problem here. I can bring 14 million Jews to Israel. Do I want the entire Jewish people to live in Israel? The answer is no. The answer is definitely no. It is not just because of the survival instinct that if something bad would happen to you, somebody in Australia will, be, will survive. So it's a, I, 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 I split, I, 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 I um, divide my risks, so I, I, I spread my risks. It's not about this. It is about something else. One hemisphere of my being, of my identity, is very internal. It's about myself, it's about my people, it's about my nation, it's about the value system. It's the, it's the independence of my people. That's about Passover, the first days of the day of independence of the Jewish people. It's about the internal identity of the people. But the other hemisphere of mine is very universalist. It's about the world. I see myself as part of the Western civilization. I cannot understand and comprehend the Western civilization without the conversation with the Jews, and I cannot understand my Judaism without the conversation with the Western civilization. I cannot understand the modern current state of affairs of the Jewish people without the Western notion of democracy and liberties, and freedoms and equality and justice. In the same way, I cannot understand Western civilization without Jesus Christ who was born and crucified and passed away as a Mishnahic Jew. I cannot understand Western civilization without Maimonides reintroducing Hellenic philosophies preserved at the Muslim philosophical realm back into Europe. I cannot understand modern time secular enlightenment without Spinoza's glasses in Amsterdam. I cannot understand 20th century without Marx and, and, and Freud. So this exchange between us and them and them and us, it's a cross fertilization, which is so essential to my very being. So the current state of affairs, which is 50% of the people more or less is living in sovereignty and dealing with the internal identity and the internal affairs of the people. And 50% of the people more or less are living outside and my interface with universalism and humanity, that's a perfect reality for me. And therefore, and therefore, for me, Israel is an essential for my identity, but I'm not ready to give up this experience and the other way around. Many people cannot live with it. Many people say you are anti zionist you are post zionist you're this and that, and, and I love these stereotypes. But whenever they tell me, are you a Zionist? So I say, before we go tell me, who is a Zionist? Is a Zionist the one born to a Zionist mother? <laughs> <laughs> what is it exactly? Okay, so what, the, my answer to all of these titles and, 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 as I said, stereotypes is the way I see the world, again, it's not either or. It is this and that integrated together. I would like an, uh, to, to ask another question on that. You, you were um, head of the Jewish agency. Um, and did, did you think in that era also uh, in this way, on this issue? Yes and no. Did I cover all the possibilities? Thank what is you. Here <laughs> is the yes and here is the no. At the first month or first period quarter of my term there, I wrote a small booklet called Brit Am, People's Covenant, in which I described the post-rescue Jewish people. The reaction I got from the fundraisers, Karen Hayesod, shut up, censor it immediately, your position is bad for fundraising. 
So immediately I translated it into five more languages and spread it around. <laughs> and I felt that the potential is there. The reason why I wanted, I left the Knesset and went to, I ran for the, uh, 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 for the position of the head of the Jewish agency was because I knew that the tidal wave of immigration from Russia plus the immigration from Ethiopia is the last massive rescue effort of the Jewish people. And at my term, the, something like 350,000 Jews immigrated from distress areas into Israel and some other places. And I'm very happy and very proud about it. But once this situation is over, we have to realize that we are living in a different neo-reality. The overwhelming majority of the Jews are living in the democratic hemisphere. We have 20,000 Jews in Iran, 4,000 Jews in Morocco, two Jews in Afghanistan do not talk to each other, <laughs> and all the rest of them are out of it. All the rest of them are out of it. And therefore, whatever I thought at the time was, I knew it's the last chapter of the heroic period of rescue, and that's it. We must move forward. And now I'm forward. Okay, thanks. Um, now a question by Omar Reis. Uh, you state that a clash of civilizations is a clash between theocracy and democracy. Um, I am under the impression that in Israel the democr uh, demo democratic side is losing due to uh, demographic factors and fatigue. How do you feel about this? Fatigue. Yes. Uh, Very tired. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, you are still awake enough to answer the question. Oh yeah, no yes. problem. Okay, I mean, great. As long as I can talk, I can stay. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me first uh, um, let me first share with you my understanding of the miracle called the Israeli democracy. There is a model in political science, and it's not an exact uh, model, but it, it makes sense, which is saying that immigrants who immigrated from totalitarian uh, 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 en political entities established totalitarian states. And immigrants who immigrated from liberal, li liberal uh, 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 countries created liberal countries. Immigrants who immigrated from the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, created, founded and created the totalitarian uh, banana republics of Latin America. And immigrants who immigrated from Great Britain founded New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and United States of America, if you can call it a liberal place. You ask Israel, what is Israel, where Israel belongs according to this model? The overwhelming majority of the Israelis a first generation from non-democratic background, be it the Muslim hemisphere, the Soviet bloc, and Nazi refugees. So the fact that we are having a democracy is a miracle against all hopes. The fact that this miracle lasts despite the external pressures by non-democratic entities which are calling every now and then for an eruption of, of authoritarian violence is also something which is shaking the very foundations of the, the Israeli democracy. And still, <clears throat> when I look around and I ask myself, let's take the litmus paper of the Israeli democracy, the place in which we fail time and again, and these are again the Israeli Arabs which are the indications to the sensitive or insensitivity of the Israeli society. And I ask myself, when you take the overwhelming majority of the Israeli Arabs, with all the withdrawals of democracy, and with everything we read in the papers and we feel in the streets, what will be the number one priority of an average Israeli Arab? To live in the democratic state of Egypt, in the democratic state of Iran, in the democratic state of Syria, in the democratic state of Saudi Arabia, in the democratic Palestinian state, or in the non-democratic Israel. 
My feeling is that still 80 some percent of the people would prefer Israel with all of its dysfunctioning democratic institutions over the alternatives. Is it enough? No, but it's a good starting point from which we have to build. And my feeling is, and this is my general approach to democracy, democracy is just an external envelope to a deeper existential commitment. Democracy is not just the voting system. Democracy is about deeper layers of freedom and liberties and equality and justice. This is still there in the Israeli society. Well, where do you find it? In <laughs> where, where do you find it? What are the signs that you feel that it exists? I'll give you three with your permission. Yeah. The first one is the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court, as, as problematic as it became in the last couple of years because of so many other challenges, is the element, element which promoted the civil rights in Israel more than any other uh, uh, organization in Israel and much more progressive and advanced than many countries in the West as well. A situation like Guantanamo cannot happen in Israel. Cannot. That's the first. The second is... Yes, but it's not Guantanamo. I don't want to go into it, though. I love to go into it, but, okay? I'm not very proud about what happens with the prisoners, but Guantanamo, you know, it's a violation of constitutional civil rights away from the uh, 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 territory of America in order to escape the constitutional sanctions and norms. Ours functions within the norms. That's the big difference. So the first is the Supreme Court, essential and crucial. <clears throat> the second is, slowly but surely, and it's a very painful process, not just because Israel in errors, but because religious and non-religious as well. Israel is accomplishing the, the book of laws by serious basic laws, it is not a constitution, and I'm the one who is not very happy about constitution, but that's for a different reason. But you have their basic laws, which are great laws, about freedoms, about dignity, about equality, that were not there 20 years ago, were not there 30 years ago, were not there 40 years ago. It's a progress. And the last one is the public, let's call it the public arena or the public debate. It is very, very difficult to explain. It's very difficult to express but just take my words for it. I've been to many places around the world, Jewish world and the normal world, okay? Mm -hmm. I've been to many places around the world. I was a majority and I was a minority. I was a pariah and I was a consensus. I was in many situations in my life. There were very, very few places in which I felt that the public is open and tolerant the way it is with issues regarding the Israeli Arabs, okay? For example, in the last 20 some years, there were so many rallies and demonstrations and vigils in Israel done by me and my friends and many others regarding the rights of the minority, the, the Arab minority in Israel. No other place in the Middle East had them. In Sabra and Shatila in Lebanon, the only place in which there was a demonstration protesting against Christian Arabs slaughtering Muslim Arabs was not in Beirut, was not in Damascus, was not in Cairo, was not in Amman, was in Tel Aviv. And I can show you many things like this. And you know how difficult it is because between me and you, my colleagues and friends, some of my colleagues and some of my friends, the 
Era, the Israeli Arab members of Knesset do not make life very easy for people like myself. In what way? Imagine who is the worst enemy of, uh, of, of, uh, of Netherlands today? Still Spain? No. <laughs> no. Uh... Okay. <laughs> it's over, right? So who is, who is the real enemy of Netherlands? Give me, I don't know what. Somebody, okay. I, I would say now uh, uh, um, the 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 um, uh, person who murdered uh, Ayan Hishiari. That's an individual. Example. Give me a nation. Give me. Um, Theo van Gogh, of course. Yes, I'm sorry. Never mind. Okay. Um, Barcelona. Okay. It was a rhetoric question. I, no. I, I imagine it, you yes. have an enemy, a next door enemy. Okay. You have a next door enemy, and this next door enemy is having a minority within Netherlands. And this minority is sending members to your parliament democratically speaking. And these representatives of the minority who are Dutch nationals mm -hmm. are supporting the enemy of Netherlands. Mm. It is so complicated. How, what do you do with it? Now, I understand why they support the Palestinian cause, because it's brothers and, as, and sisters. And as long as your nation is in conflict with your country, uh, it's in, inevitable. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, sometimes some of the expressions are, how shall I put it, challenging. Yeah. Not to say provoking, not to say something else. Mm -hmm. And still, it is there. It is tolerated. And I don't see any other place in the world who can contain this kind of internal, co internal contradiction, internal oxymoron. And for me, it's a promising sign, mm -hmm. as difficult as it is. OK, uh, another question. Oh. Um, <laughs> shall we? Uh, uh, um, five o'clock, I have a flight. No, yes, I have a okay. TV, no, I have no, a TV uh, interview <laughs> in five o'clock in the airport, OK? okay? Um, on, on the clash of uh, civilizations, uh, 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 Anat uh, asks um, whether there's also an economic issue behind this, um, the, 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 the big, um, big conflicts in the world at the moment. Anat, why are you? What, what, what? About the economic dimension of the world conflict? The reason there is no, globalization plays a role there. And the have and the have not is there. And because of the time on one hand and my ignorance on the other hand, I cannot go into details. I do not want to go into details. I want to share with you a framework for attitude, okay? People say, what do we do about the immigrants? Because the gaps in the society between have and have not has some racial, religious, ethnical characteristic as well. Here or wherever it is. I think it is not, it cannot be discussed as just here and now issue. The framework is at least 300 years old framework. The 19th century was the century in which the first white world invaded the third world, exploited it, humiliated it, raped it, emptied it. The 20th century was the century of disengagement. The first world withdrew from the third world. And the 21st century looks like the invasion of the third world into the first world with the traumas and the memories and the wounds and the anger. So whatever the conversation is, it is not just about, ha, huh, you are poor and I'm rich, you are Muslim and I'm Christian. It is what happened 200 years ago and 100 years ago and what will happen in the next 100 years. So globalization, which is economic only, is too shallow. 
I need the other dimensions as well there. And part of the responsibility of the first world to Africa and to the Middle East is to assume and resume responsibility to the disaster and destruction they left behind. Okay, we'll, we'll do one last question. Um, <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, it's a question by Hayo Meyer. Mm -hmm. um, why did you so fully neglect the influence on the Enlightenment in describing um, the situation in the Western world that brought the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, of the United Nations about? Why did I neglect it? That's a question. Maybe... Um, uh, in the I'm sorry? You were quite explicit about it in the answer. In your introduction, you did not mention the Enlightenment at all, and, but you did later. In your answers, you did. First, you are right, but there are so many other things I did not mention. My children, my <laughs> wife, okay? Uh, I tell you, you know, it's interesting. I want to think about it, why I do not see it as, you know, as part of my immediate introduction. Part of it is because I take it for granted. You know, I, I, it's like oxygen for me. I do not see myself living in any other reality but in the reality of enlightenment. So I didn't feel like I have to address it, but you're right, I have to. Next time, I'm coming tomorrow morning, I have an hour lecture about enlightenment. Right after <laughs> the um, Amsterdam Marathon. Yeah, no, next year. <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Very